Hello and welcome to episode 258 of AvTalk. I am Ian Pechnik, here as always with... Jason Rabinowitz. We're back again. How are you, Ian? I'm great, Jason. It's hot dog week. It is hot dog week. It will be hot dog Saturday coming up soon. And to, hot to dog a Saturday. lot of people listening, that might not mean anything and, and shouldn't mean anything. <laughs> For longtime listeners, they'll know what it means. But if you're just tuning in, Jason and I often travel to our respective cities. Actually, you know what? Episode 258 is a decent time. I'm springing this on Jason, so forgive me, Jason. It's a decent okay. time to welcome new listeners and kind of give a bit of a background. If you're a longtime listener, if you listen to the show for you know many, many episodes, this is all information you know. But if you're new to the podcast, which you very well may be after everything that has happened already this year, I, I think we've welcomed quite a bit of new listenership for perhaps not great reasons they started listening to the podcast or not good news that they started listening to the podcast, but welcome nonetheless. And we hope you're enjoying the show. So just by way of introduction and just going over who we are and why we do this podcast, I am Flight Radar 24's communications director. This is what I, I live and breathe, aviation, staring at planes on a screen, whether it's on a website or in the app, and talking about Flight Radar 24 specifically, aviation generally. If you've met me in person, it's probably been at some aviation-themed event, and you may have said, hey, I've got a question about Flight Radar 24, and then apologized for that, and I don't know why, because this is literally my job, and I love doing it. Jason has a real job. I do. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but talking about airplanes on this podcast that we don't charge anyone for and talking about it on Twitter doesn't pay the bills, but I do have a real job. That's on a need-to-know basis, though. That pays enough of your bills so that we can travel to each other from time to time. I'm based in Chicago. Jason's based in New York. And this weekend, Jason's going to come for a hot dog. That's right. The annual hot dog pilgrimage. I do it as cheaply as possible, typically. And I'm very happy that Spirit is back in the mix. They have been out mm -hmm. of the New York, Chicago market for quite a while. The flight actually just resumed today, I think, which is great news for me. $42 out to Chicago, and then I'm flying back on an ever-decreasingly expensive United flight back to New York. So I'm excited about that. And with all the vouchers I've accumulated from United lowering my fare, I'm going to buy a lot of extra hot dogs. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. So it's we'll, a great we'll, plan. we'll bring listeners the update next week, I guess, on how many hot dogs were actually consumed. Speaking of Spirit Airlines, may this be the last time we ever discuss this giant waste of everyone's time. Man, I don't know. I feel like we haven't heard the last of this, but this, no, this certainly feels no, like the don't end. Don't say things like that. There's always uh, more. Come on. There's always more. Okay. Well, then let this be the last time we talk about it for a while. I refer to JetBlue and Spirit deciding, realizing, finally understanding that this merger is not going to happen and announcing that they have decided to part ways after spending an ungodly amount of money. I think Ned Russell put the figure at somewhere north of half a billion dollars, not on the merger, just to get the merger going, which is, I mean, just incredible to me. So they've said, now we're done. What they said was, given the conditions that we would have to meet in order to successfully complete the merger, we do not believe that we can do those things in time for the time-defined merger agreement that we agreed to back in 2022 before that runs out. And so they said, we're just going to walk away. Yeah. And that was a self-imposed deadline. I think it was in June of this year upcoming that, that they had set in the terms, if we can't get the deal done by this date, we're not going to do the deal. And it became increasingly evident that at any appeal, they would have to go through the US court system. It just wasn't going to happen before that time. There was just no chance that was going to happen. And now that JetBlue has new leadership at the very top of the chain, it seems like there is no appetite to pursue this any further, which is the smart move 
they seem to have finally realized that this was a gigantic money pit, waste of time. It wasn't going to work, at least under the current administration here in the US. The timing just wasn't right. And now everyone has realized, wow, maybe we should take a step back and maybe we're overpaying for spirits. Maybe it was a good thing that the DOJ won this argument because I can't imagine JetBlue successfully gobbling up spirit and this being a, a positive outcome, knowing everything we now know. I mean, if forget everything we now know. The conversation never changed. It never made sense. But the longer time went on, the more it didn't make sense. I mean, you yeah, have, we just added to the reasons that it, this was exactly, a bad idea. exactly. It was never a particularly good idea. But also remember, JetBlue was originally in a bidding war with Frontier for Spirit. And they ended up inflating the price tag for Spirit by nearly a billion dollars, from like 2.9 to 3.8 billion dollars on the table. That is an astronomical amount to add on to what Frontier was originally offering. I don't know how JetBlue was ever going to afford that and then afford to absorb all of that operation and then afford to refurbish all of Spirit's aircraft into JetBlue's specs when it barely managed to do that to its own fleet. It took more than half a decade to do that to its own fleet. So I don't know what they were really thinking, but the leadership that set them down this path is no longer in that position. A new, not fresh, not really new, but refreshed leadership at the top since Joanna Garrity is not new to the airline, nor is Marty St. George who becomes also once again senior leadership, but it's uh, back to basics for JetBlue. And for Spirit, that's a lot less clear. Yeah. I called this a giant waste of everyone's time introducing the segment, and I stand by that. I mean, to a T, I cannot think of anyone who was like, this is a great idea, and, and who made that argument publicly. I mean, pretty much just the lawyers who knew this wasn't going to work. And there was, ah. I mean, yeah, I mean, they're, they're the, the only ones that ever stand to gain anything from something like this. But yeah, Spirit is in a really bad position at this point. It's got no partner. It's got no real strategy to turn it around and make a profit. It's got a ridiculous number of aircraft grounded because of the Pratt & Whitney GTF issue. It has a nearly insurmountable amount of debt that matures next year, more than the, I think, the market worth of Spirit itself. So yeah, not great. Yeah. Spirit is in a dire position here. I hope they have a plan because the one where they get gobbled up by another airline doesn't seem to, at least at this point, be a reality. Yeah. It's going to be rough going for Spirit. They seem to be working towards a plan, but at the moment, I don't quite see it yet. I don't know. The plan is to get me to Chicago for a hot dog on Saturday. And beyond that, I got nothing. <laughs> be, yeah, yeah. As long as they're around for Saturday morning, then we're fine. Yep. Okay. So we teased this, I think, last episode where we looked at American Airlines hosting its first investor day in seven years. Okay. And then a big aircraft order. And they came through. They came through with 260 orders for narrow body jets split between the 737 MAX and the A320neo family. There was much made about the order for the 737-10 MAX. I like Ned very much. He's a very good friend. Go but on. I think he was the first tweet I read where it was called a vote of confidence. And I apologize if I jumped on that. I didn't mean to jump on that. But my take on this was it's less a vote of confidence for the 737-10. And American doesn't actually want these planes that quickly. So they said, okay, well, why not take them if we can get them for... I don't know what Boeing is selling the MAX 10 for these days, but if you order a whole bunch of them, I bet you could probably just pay... A dollar, two dollars, maybe three. I don't, I don't know. No money down. I don't know. We're definitely in the no money down, zero percent financing area. No credit, no problem with the Max Ten. But the thing I wanted to talk about is, I mean, first of all, the orders still split, so that again, less a vote of confidence and more a reality. But this thing 
to me is very interesting. And I started looking at this a different way because Gavin Werbeloff, our resident numbers expert, flagged this for me. And he penned a piece over on Air Insight about this. And basically, this aircraft order was not so much an aircraft order as Americans saying, we'll buy more planes as long as you don't make us take the ones that we already ordered soon. Okay, so it's a deferral with a bunch of added on top on the back half? Exactly. I guess. Yeah. So Gavin flagged the 10K that American filed, and they had 20 737 MAX family scheduled to be delivered this year, 33 scheduled to be delivered next year, and 21 scheduled to be delivered in 2026. I'm still getting used to the fact that it's 2024. After the order, American issued an 8K, which is an update to financial statements, and saying it now has 20 737 MAX family aircraft due to be delivered this year. It more than halves next year's order book from 33 to 14. And again, more than halves 2026 order book from 21 down to 10. It also takes down its A320neo family commitments, stays at three for this year, drops it from 21 to 16 next year, and then 35 to 21 in 2026. What's most interesting, I think, is what happens, again, theoretically, in 2027, where American is projecting taking zero 737 family aircraft, a big donut, and only up to 31 A320neo family aircraft. So its highest point of taking on uh, 320 family is its lowest point, which is zero of the max. Very interesting to see a year sandwiched between 10 deliveries and 20 deliveries of just taking nothing yeah. from the 7-3 family, which is, and it goes on. Americans' fleet outlook is really stacked into like the hypothetical down the line future because it goes all the way out to the 2029 and thereafter column where they have 64 320 neo family and 95 737 max family aircraft so i would put those more in the hypothetical they're on the order book we want them now but things change maybe we don't want them we don't want them now but maybe later yeah we those definitely don't right. want them now i mean 95 airplanes in a year is just under two per week well, that's 2029 so, and thereafter. We don't know what that stretches to. That could oh, okay, be okay, 10 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. That could be two years. Or, 2029 we, we to 2039, 49. We don't know. Whatever. But that's the complicated bit of this. What's crazy is that airlines have to plan 10 years ahead of time for what aircraft they want to take when they don't know the market realities of what happens 10 years from now. It's going to change and change and change and change before that. But it's a real indication that American just they probably want these aircraft and they got to put their orders in now, but they have no need for them, at least in that quantity now. They want aircraft, not necessarily these aircraft. Well, you know what they do want? And we didn't mention this. So the order uh, was 85 321 Neo, 85 737 Max 10, 90. E-175s. And indeed. listener, I would forgive you for thinking that would be the E-175 E-2, but no, that is not the case. It is the now long in the tooth, regular, I guess, E-1. I don't think it's marketed as that, just the OG E-175. Again, American is intending to take these to 2029 and thereafter. The column says 30, so I would assume this is at least through 2030. American will be taking delivery of a lot of E-175s. Earlier this week on Twitter, I called the E-175 the cockroach of modern aircraft. And I meant that not in a derogatory way, but in a... You can't kill it. You can't kill it. It won't you die. You can't get rid of it. Not that it's a bad aircraft. It's a good aircraft. I love it. I will almost always seek out an E-175 over many oh, other Oh, yeah. It's, it's a wonderful plane to fly on. Great airplane. And everyone I know that's flown the aircraft loves flying it. It is just remarkable that an aircraft that first flew in 2004 will still be being manufactured and delivered to a major airline like American well into the 2030s. It's disappointing that they will not be taking the E-175, E-2, or any of the American airlines, not just American airline, but any of the US-based airlines 
are still not taking any of the re-engined Embraer aircraft because of contractual issues with their union and this and that. And the aircraft is too heavy, too long, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it's amazing that this aircraft will continue to be in operation probably through the 2040s, which is, I mean, that's something that's really only reserved for the 737 at this point. But every other narrowbody has been re-engined or significantly overhauled at some point. The the 73 through its lifespan went from the classic to the NG to the Max. The 320 series has the CO and the Neo. The the Embraer is just an E-175 is an E-175. Maybe the winglets go out a little more than they go up. And that's about it. And it's it's disappointing to me that we have a version of this aircraft with vastly more efficient engines that the industry, for reasons, is just kind of ignoring. I mean, I hesitate to say ignoring. I mean, it's discounting because it's not contractually possible. I mean, yeah, contracts can be changed. Pay scales can be rearranged. The aircraft could be flown mainline, which I don't think we will ever see that. But to me, you have this regional aircraft, which there is a better version of it available and now. And when airlines say we're doing all these things to curb carbon emissions, we're green, we're green, we're green. And then you have this aircraft that's potentially on the shelf that is, I don't know, markedly more efficient. And it's just not even being considered because of artificial constraints, which is just, to me, very disappointing. Yeah, there's no doubt that it's disappointing. Okay. This is one of those things where I feel like I've said this before, and I'm sure if I went back and looked at all the transcripts of the episodes, I would introduce multiple segments involving the NTSB as describing this as coming out swinging. But man, oh man, is that exactly what happened today in testimony in front of Congress by NTSB chair Jennifer Homedy. She's just been taking shots at everyone recently. I love it. And she gets results. So here's what happened. She was attending a US Senate hearing. And as part of that hearing, criticized Boeing's lack of cooperation with the NTSB investigation into the Alaska Airlines door plug accident. And Hamandi had this to say, quote, Boeing has not provided us with the documents and information that we have requested numerous times over the past few months. There are two options. Either they, meaning the documents, exist and we don't have them, or they do not exist. She went on to say mm-hmm. that if they don't exist, that, quote, raises concerns about quality assurance, quality management, safety management systems within Boeing. Oh, boy, does it ever. Yeah. The documents that she's referring to and the documents that the NTSB has requested involve who did the work on the door plug. Who were the people? How was the work accomplished? What documents are available? They want to know exactly step by step who worked on the door, who worked on the door plug, who did the work, where the bolts went, et cetera, et cetera. And one of those threads there is who worked on the door or who had access to the door plug. So later today, after Hamidi says these things in front of the Senate, Boeing comes out with a statement that says, we have now provided the full list of individuals on the 737 door team in response to a recent request. This next sentence, I think, is one of my favorite Boeing, definitely written by a lawyer quotes, I think of all time. With respect to documentation, if the door plug removal was undocumented, there would be no documentation to share. Wow. Okay. So earlier today on Twitter, I actually came to that conclusion myself and said, look, if Boeing hasn't provided this information, it's probably because it doesn't exist. And here we have Boeing saying, not saying, doing everything they can to dance around the answer by saying, if there wasn't any documentation, there's nothing to share. So we have to jump to this conclusion, but I think it's pretty fair to do so. I don't think we're jumping. I don't think we're jumping, but Boeing hasn't come out and explicitly said, we screwed up, we suck, there is no documentation, this was done without any documentation. Without actually explicitly saying that, that's basically what they're saying, is that the door plug was removed with no documentation, 
a massive, massive, unthinkable, ridiculous breakdown in quality control, SMS, all sorts of things that should have gone into logging exactly what was going on in the manufacture and the repair of this aircraft before it was delivered. It's just unthinkable that they could do something like remove a door plug and do major repairs and remove bolts and then not even document it at all. Like That's just... I wish they would just say it, just own it, but I understand why in lawyer speak here they said what they said, but it's just, wow. Yeah. So the back end of that statement is, I think, the most important thing to take away from that. They have now provided the full list of 25 names. Hamidi said that there's a a team of 25 people and a manager. The manager has been out on medical leave and the NTSB has not been able to interview that individual, but Prior to today, they had not received the names of the other 25 people who work on the team. Boeing now says that they have provided the full list to the NTSB. So I guess all you need to do is go in front of the US Senate and say things in public for you know the record, and then Boeing will, will get right on that. Yeah, not great. Anytime Boeing now in the very near future says we're making changes, we're making changes, we're being transparent. Well, again, we have something to point to to say, actually, no, you're not. It took damn near an act of Congress to get you to provide a list of names of people who worked on this. And I don't believe it's because they didn't know who's on this team. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes to figure that out. They just apparently chose not to provide it. From what it sounds like is that Boeing provided an initial, and this I'm going off of reporting by Dominic Gates in the Seattle Times, Boeing provided an initial list of people that they thought would have relevant information. That's great. But what Boeing thinks right now is is not relevant. They've shown that that's not relevant. And the NDSB said, no, we want to talk to everybody. And then Boeing finally provided that list. In addition to this, after we recorded last week, we talked about you know, the FAA audit that was still ongoing when FAA Administrator Mike Whitaker gave Boeing 90 days, which is May 29th for who anyone who's counting. That would be 84 days from today, Wednesday, March 6th, to come up with a plan and to publicly disclose that plan to address both the expert panel and the FAA's six-week audit, which concluded right after basically we had recorded or a few days. They actually gave us a few days. So the FAA found, quote, most multiple instances where the companies, those companies being Boeing and Spear Aerosystems, which manufactures the fuselage for the 737, they allegedly failed to comply with manufacturing quality control requirements. Non-compliance issues in Boeing's manufacturing process control parts handling and storage, this goes back to what we just talked about, and product control. And the FAA is providing these details to the public as an update on the agency's ongoing investigation. Not great. No. But nothing hugely surprising. No, there's no smoking gun or anything here. It's just all around sloppy, I guess. Yeah, all around sloppy. And so as part of Boeing's response to all of this, they are now once again looking to reacquire Spirit Aerosystems. Because if you remember way back in the good old battle days of when you made things and then assembled them and then delivered those things from start to finish, Boeing didn't own Spirit Aerosystems because it was just Boeing Wichita. Mm -hmm. And they built the fuselages, and they shipped the fuselages, and then they put the plane together, and then the plane rolled out and it flew away. Years ago, Boeing spun off Spirit into its own company, and now it's looking to spin them back in. Yeah, more or less. I mean, it it seems like something that they probably need to do, but it's like the inmates taking over the asylum at this point is Boeing... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> With the mess that it is at this point coming in to take over Spirit, like is that going to really improve things? Is Spirit so far gone that the only thing that makes sense is for Boeing in its current disorganized state really going to improve Spirit? I'm not sold on that. What I will say on this topic is unexpectedly, I think everyone is in agreement that the like 20-minute long piece on John Oliver's show on HBO or Max or whatever the 
hell it is this day, focused on Boeing. It is probably, I think Jeremy agreed with this, it's probably the best layman explainer of what happened to Boeing and how it got into this situation. And it covers a bit of the spirit spinoff and reacquisition and how they got there. So if you're looking for a quick explainer, maybe not quick, it's like 20 minutes, but it's a pretty good explainer on, on what happened and how they got to this point. Yeah, it was, I think, as good as an explanation as you're going to get without having followed the industry for a good chunk of your life. Yeah. So I guess we'll we'll leave it there. Let's move on to some interesting news, some surprising news. The timing, I think, is the most surprising thing about this. But Ethiopian Airlines has ordered the 777X. All right. This one seemed to have come out of absolutely nowhere. It was just kind of randomly announced on Twitter like yesterday. So that would be Monday yeah, or Tuesday. Why not? Week. I don't quite remember. Just announced, kind of out of nowhere, not an ad, an air show, not an, any marquee event. Just like, hey, let's order some aircraft for eight firm plus 12 options for the 777-9. I believe at this stage it is only an MOU, and, and we like to talk about how it's not a real order yet. It's a memorandum of understanding, so they'll, they'll firm it up at some point. But the timing of it was unexpected, but you have to remember in context here, Ethiopian typically – at least in the last couple of decades, has actually been on the forefront of taking on new tech aircraft. It was, sure. I think, the first aircraft in, uh, airline in the world to operate both the 787 and the A350 at the same time, if not the first, one of the first. It was a very early 787 or A350 operator. We know famously, obviously, it was one of the earliest 737 MAX operators. So operating the 777X rather early on, I guess, isn't that surprising for Ethiopian. It's just the timing of it was like, huh? Where, where did that come from? Yeah. I mean, I think that this definitely plays into their goal of being able to connect as much of the world through Audis as possible. And with the range of the 777X, I mean, that certainly becomes more an easier lift. But also, I mean, the strong cargo connotations of, of the 777 and the 777X, I mean, that's certainly something that they're keen on taking advantage of. So, I mean, it, the order makes sense. It just kind of came out of nowhere. Ethiopian already had, I think, or was intending to order the 777X freighter. I don't know if they ever got around to it, but they were hinting at it for quite a while. But interestingly, of all of the new aircraft, Ethiopian doesn't have any Airbus narrow bodies, which I think is a interesting twist since it, it loves all these other new type aircraft, but no Airbus narrow bodies. Maybe they'll announce that next week randomly on Twitter. Sure, why not? No, that, that mm -hmm. one's going to, they'll do that on TikTok. Oh, okay. So we've been working on some interesting things. We talked a little bit about Spirit and, and how they've been affected by the Pratt & Whitney Gear Toberfan groundings. We've talked about this over and over and over again because it's just affected so many airlines and so many aircraft. So we pulled some numbers and we've got a, a great blog post up on the Flight Raider 24 blog by Andy Ainsworth about you know Wiz having 20% of its fleet sitting around. And that number is is growing, though it won't grow as much as a percentage because they continue to take new aircraft so quickly that they've done a fairly good job of just maintaining what they've got, even though they're parking more and more aircraft. I only bring that up in the context of the podcast to say that one of the things that they've done is extended leases for A320 CEO aircraft that they're keeping in the fleet, but they're also wet leasing capacity in. So you could end up on a go to sky 737-800 that's registered OMGTF. Oh my, GTF. Hey, it's, it's in the air right now. 737-800. <laughs> Ooh, operating two and a half hours late that, to, to Bucharest. Not great, but yeah, that's a fun one. Yeah, I just wanted to, to bring that up. But we'll toss a link in the show notes because the, the piece is interesting to see how they're dealing with those capacity issues. As best they can. Yes, exactly. Speaking of GTF engines, Iceland Air has selected the Pratt & Whitney geared turbofan to power its recently ordered Airbus narrowbody fleet. Yeah, Those good luck with that. Are, uh, <laughs> well, now that they've figured out the problems, getting the new engines should be just fine. Sure. Except 
It's not because engines are one of the main supply chain constraints, as are so many other parts, to the point where United Airlines expects 102 fewer aircraft this year than it had previously. For that them. is a lot of aircraft. That is a lot more than are in entire fleets for airlines right now, and they expect to take 102 fewer aircraft 102 this year. So, fewer new aircraft. Th- this is just deliveries. Certainly won't be taking the MAX 10 as they no. expected to this year. I guess the bulk of that, the rest would probably be the A321 it's, Neo. Yeah. I mean, it's across the board. Not great. No one is living up to expectations, but everyone's really excited about ramping up their production capacity to build uh, 4 billion planes a year only to let every airline down when they can't do it. Exactly. So United's going to take 102 fewer aircraft this year. They're still going to take 63 aircraft this year. Hey, that's good. That's a lot. They were going to take 165. I mean, that's crazy to me. Well, their messaging for this year was that they were going to take a new aircraft every other day. I think through through the summer, they said they were going to take a new aircraft every other day. Now it's like every other week. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, So, I mean, it's still a lot of planes. I mean, 63 is nothing to sneeze at, but it's not going to happen this year. Ryanair says it will take only 40 out of 57 expected 737 MAX aircraft by June. So that's not as big of a number gap, but certainly still a hit to Ryanair's growth plans. We learned this week that the fix for the MAX 7, the anti-ice fix, might take longer, up to 12 months, rather than the nine-month forecast that David Calhoun gave at the earnings report. So that pushes things back even further. Tim Clark is preparing for the eventuality that the 777X might not show up until 2026. Who knows if he'll still be the president of Emirates by then, but- He will just not retire until that aircraft is delivered. (laughs) He's going to retire on that delivery flight. To say that Boeing is the only aircraft manufacturer affected by this, that's certainly not the case. Airbus is still dealing with a ton of supply chain constraints and issues, especially with their A320 Neo family aircraft, so the A320 all the way up to the A321 XLR. So those are also not running quite on time. And then there's a new entrant into the, no, we're not going to have that done when we said we were. Most of the Russian aircraft programs have been delayed two or more years. The MC-21, the SSJ New, which is the all Russian parts version of the SSJ, the IL-114, and whatever other aircraft you want to throw in there, all delayed roughly two years or more. Now, that is the least surprising news I think we have discussed in a while. This stuff is hard. I mean, (laughs) the the timeline that they gave themselves to make these projects go through in Russia was was ridiculous. And I I think they've finally at least admitted publicly that uh, maybe we need a couple more years. What they're doing is, is pretty dramatic. So take your time. This is a follow-up to a story that we talked about, oh, months and months ago now. But Ukrainian prosecutors have formally charged ex-Antonov executives with obstructing the Ukrainian armed forces in preparing a defense of Hostomel Airport, which is where the AN-225 was based. So prosecutors are saying these executives did not allow the Ukrainian military onto the airport property or wouldn't let them set up defenses, basically. And that allowed the Russian military the opportunity to damage the airport as much as they did. They don't come out and say, because of this specifically, the Antonov An-225 is no more. But the argument is strongly implied there, that it was you know their intransigence and resistance to allowing the Ukrainian military to defend the airport that led to the destruction of the aircraft. So we're still in a waiting game because they're supposed to rebuild it, but that sounds like it won't happen until after the war and the war is unfortunately nowhere near over. So I guess we'll we'll continue to wait and see. Yep. Jason. Yes. I don't want your head to get too big here. Okay. But you called it. 
Oh, what did I call? Tell me more. Last week, we talked about the issue with the CFM56 thrust reversers, where after a pilot activated reverse thrust, but then conducted a go around, which you're not supposed to do out of procedure, but it's happened multiple times. And to the same guy. To the same guy. The CFM56 reverser, the engine control unit software is being revised to reduce the possibility and risk for the reverser to be locked open in the event that a pilot initiates a go around after thrust reverse has been selected. Hmm. That sounds awfully like what I suggested last week. It is. Is, I assume, CFM has had engineers working on this for months and yes. months already. I am not taking credit for this, nor would any reasonable person do that, but sometimes timing is fun that way. <laughs> what gets even better is they, they performed an analysis, and the analysis indicated that this was a one in one million chance that a go-around after reverser selection. It happened to the same guy twice. Twice. One uh, one in a million odds because they – this is what I love about the industry. I don't have the numbers open now, but they said they analyzed like 4 million flights or something like that. Or maybe the number was dramatically higher. 3.4 million flights across 31 operators. There you go. That's an outstanding analysis. I assume that took a very long time to do. And out of – 3.4 3.4 million flights, you got the same guy doing it twice, and yet it's only one in a million. So there's one other person who's done this. <laughs> this guy accounts for two thirds of the 3.4 million flights where this happened. Oh, that is incredible. That is a fun stat. We, we got to tell Gavin, he's our numbers guy, but we just came up with some fun numbers. He'll get a kick out of that one. That's outstanding. But software will be rolled out in the near future to prevent this one guy and one other person <laughs> from uh, doing this in the future. Oh, that's the best. And to close the show, we're keeping 747s around for just a little bit longer by shuffling them between airlines. Jason, tell me what's going on. Qatar took a whole bunch of 747-8Fs in the latter half of the 2010s. They had that whole blockade thing, and they really, really needed to ramp up their, their freight capacity to get everything into Qatar. Since all the land crossings were restricted, they, they really had to be self-sustaining, which is kind of difficult in Qatar since it's mostly desert. They they don't really have crops there. So everything needed to be flown in if it couldn't be shipped or driven in. And they took a bunch of 747-8Fs, which I guess they don't need anymore. So UPS will take them off their hands for them, which is just a, a nice nice thing. You wouldn't want these to go to the boneyard after just a couple Absolutely of years. So, not. so good on UPS for taking some some lightly used 747s. There you go. Keeping them around for just a little bit longer. Actually, it's UPS, so a lot longer. This has been episode 258 of AvTalk. Thank you all so very much for listening. I am Ian Pechnik here, as always, with Jason Rabinowitz. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.